published in 2001 by American author Lois McMaster Bujold, The Curse of Chalion is the first in a series called the World of the Five Gods series, and that consists of four novels and 11 novellas. The story itself follows the exploits of a ruined man named Kazaril as he finds himself entangled in a complex succession plot as the secretary of a princess in line to inherit the throne of the land of Chalion. Curse of Chalion currently sits at 4.1 stars out of 5 on Goodreads, which was accumulated from over 38,000 ratings. This review is accompanied by art from the series on my YouTube channel, and if you like this podcast, please like and subscribe on YouTube and Spotify. This review will contain minor spoilers for the plot, just so you know. So, a quick rundown of the story. Our protagonist, Kazaril, also known as Kaz, has returned to his homeland, to Kalyon, after... Well, I don't know if it's Kalyon or Chalion. I'm going to say Chalion. After spending two years as a galley slave on a boat, after he was betrayed by one of his military superiors, the Lord Dondo. Kazaril returns to the household he served as a boy, where he is hired as the tutor of the royal daughter there named Izel, who is second in line to the throne of Chalion behind her brother Titus and her uncle Oriko, who is actually pretty ill. We find out that the family is cursed, as is the whole land of Chalion, and so that's the backdrop of this story. The family is invited to the capital city, where Kazaril is reunited with his betrayer, Lord Dondo, and discovers another plot to eliminate the royal family and force Izel into a marriage with Dondo, his betrayer. Kazaril attempts to save Izel from this fate by using dark magic to kill the Lord Dondo, and in the process actually succeeds and fails. So he, he succeeds in killing Dondo, But where he fails, and this is one of the primary mysteries of the story, is Dondo's soul attaches itself to Kazaril and is growing in his stomach like a tumor alongside the demon that was sent to kill both of them. So the second and third acts of the plot revolve around Kazaril searching for a cure for himself as well as locate a way to remove the killing curse that is from Izel's house before it ruins the family and the entire land. So the mood of Chalion is both happy and kind of paranoid. So although Kazaril and the royal family are in grave danger from both the curse upon the family and the political plots within the city, the author, Bujold, does not neglect the happier moments of the characters' lives, including these scenes of pleasant walks through the forest and happy wedding ceremonies and these generally positive interactions between secondary characters. But the happy moments, as I mentioned, are also surrounded by paranoia, because these happy moments serve to amplify the background of fear that pulses continuously in the background of this story. Powerful characters often have ulterior motives, and once the various plots are unmasked, every minute that Kaz and Izel spend in mundane activities increases their chances of ruin. So these moods obviously inform the pacing of this book, which is, ironically, both hurried and leisurely. As the book went on, I found myself reading quickly, as though the, you know, this me speed reading would somehow force these characters to move faster. I was reading really quickly through the slower and happier moments in the hopes that they would pick up the importance of what's going on. And so all of this is held together um, in this really advanced flowery prose that actually somehow works without feeling very pretentious. So if you want to increase your vocabulary, this is the book for you, but also keep your phone and your dictionary nearby so that you can look up some of these rather advanced English words. The prose actually, to me, feels kind of similar to George Martin's Game of Thrones series, but with a more advanced level of the English language. So if you're trying to get into reading, or back into reading, or back into the fantasy genre, I recommend that you actually save this book for later on. The themes are standard fare for fantasy novels with a European-ish setting. There are warring houses and political marriages, black magic, 
advanced religious systems and political intrigue, all of those which have been standard fantasy fare. But since Bujol focuses more on the kind of everyday mundane moments for our main characters, the themes are actually more personal than the broader ones of war and magic. I believe that the primary theme here is that of perseverance. So Kaz's entire arc is one of constant struggle for normalcy, and repeated references to his age and weakening body really drive home the fact that sometimes actually doing the right thing will push humans to their absolute limit and even to the point of risking life and limb. More than once, Kaz's unholy tumor evoked feelings that I imagine, you know, pregnant women may sometimes feel or the feelings that one might have when they are diagnosed with a form of cancer or some other type of malignant disease. That might not have been intentional on her part, but it might have been. Another theme present is that of religious faith. The theology of Chalion is simple, but it's nuanced enough to be believable. So in essence, there are five gods in this universe. They are the father, the mother, the son, the daughter, and the bastard, each with their own devotees and own realm of authority. And in fact, magic in this world is informed by those five spirits. And so in this case, I would say that this book is actually the daughter's book. And Kaz finds himself an unwitting agent in her cosmic story. Which I found myself asking who among us really in the real world, haven't at some point or another felt that we were the butt of some cosmic joke or the victim of God's either negligence or his malice. And so those feelings are very present in this book. And so if you've ever personally experienced those feelings, you will connect, I think, with these characters. There's also another theme, and I think it's family. And the links that humans will go to ensure the survival of their own family over the family of others. This is both a positive and a negative trait. And even the theology in this world is family centric. And so Kaz's lack of a family into his mid thirties, it places him into the, an even lonelier role than many of the other people in the story. I really enjoyed the characters and I was surprised that the novel actually has a very, very satisfying payoff. And I realized that I suppose I've become so used to the current bleak and nihilistic and grimdark stories from the past 10 years or so in entertainment, and not so much in books. Yes, it's there in books, but it's also in video games, it's in movies, it's everywhere in entertainment and has been for the past decade or so. And I realized that um, stories with satisfying endings like this one actually surprise me now. I'm actually expecting something horrible and pessimistic and negative. And you know what? Just because a book has a satisfying payoff doesn't mean it actually is a happy ending. It just means that the climax and the buildup was actually worth all the time that was invested into the story. And so, you know, this book really does have a great payoff and it's not a grim dark story. And so if you're tired of these dark negative, fantasy, gritty stories, then this book might be the one for you. But she delivers in the end, and the third act makes the reading worthwhile. So as I mentioned earlier, you're going to get similar themes and tropes that you get from medieval fantasy books like this. You know, in particular, um, this one has the very popular um, trope, which is called the Crystal Dragon Jesus which means that the religion in this story is very similar to real world Christianity and its cultural influence on medieval Europe. And so when you have the trope of crystal dragon Jesus, your story is going to have a stand in for the Roman Catholic church, even if the names and the ideas are slightly different. Another obvious trope is that of the wise mentor type. And in this case, it is someone from a foreign nation. And as with other books that I've reviewed, this one also has, um, I think, the most um, sweeping and the most, maybe the most relevant trope here is called the fantasy counterpart culture trope, which is when the world of a fantasy story is based on real world events and cultures, but with enough differences to make 
to make it realistic fantasy. So Chalion is actually based on a real world event called the Reconquista, which was around 720 AD, 722 AD is when it started. And it waged for, you know, 700 years. Um, and it was a series of military campaigns that Christian kingdoms waged against Muslim kingdoms. And so um, there are events and even the map is similar to Southern Europe during this time. And there's a real world equivalent there. And so if you're interested in that, definitely look that up. So plot points from here mirror plot points from this real world situation in the same way that certain parts of George Martin's works mirrored other famous European conflicts like the War of the Roses, for example. But I was also happy that some of some tropes were actually avoided, like the corrupt church trope. I've mentioned that multiple times in my videos. It is such a trope in fantasy stories where you have an evil corrupt church and this story is actually the exception the clergy here are presented as genuinely good people and as objective beacons of hope and i found that very positive overall i found the curse of chalion it's a fantastic read and i recommend it to people who would want a challenging fantasy book with a very satisfying payoff and so for those reasons and those i've listed in the review I've given The Curse of Chalion five stars out of five. So thanks so much for listening, guys. If you like what you heard, make sure you subscribe. Comment your thoughts down below if you're watching on YouTube, and I will see you in the next episode. Happy reading.